third and final hour of this December 15th, 2005, Thursday edition. You know, I got a surprise, I don't know, six, eight months ago, a year ago, I don't remember now, Dean, uh, when Dean Hagman, who I've watched on the X-Files and who I'd also uh, seen on The Lone Gun, and I've talked about that particular pilot episode quite a bit because it's parallels, it's almost exact parallels with 9-11, when uh, Dean Hagman gave me a call and said, hey, uh, I'm in town. Right. Well, Al, it's great to see you again, by the way. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, I, um, for those who don't know, I was an actor on The X-Files for nine seasons, ten years, plus our own spin-off, The Lone Gunman. I'm the one that looked like Garth from Wayne's World. Thank you very much for everyone who's talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I had the loud blonde hair and the horn rim glasses and the, the rock T-shirts with the Ramones and all that sort of thing. You were my favorite character, I have to say. I was always glad whenever the uh, conspiracy theorist guys popped up. That's right. And, you know, the, uh, it, with the writers like Chris Carter, and, and they were listening to shows like yours and, and Art Bell and stuff to get a sense of how to write for us and how to, like, do that. So you were major, major influences. Wow, I'm on flattered. I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. They were all keeping, uh, keeping tabs on everything. Uh, which made the show so relevant back then. But I like that attention. It's better mm -hmm. than attention from DynCorp. Yeah, exactly. Though I just heard about that now, that you, uh, you're a bit threatened by these guys. Man, I tell you, these are the guys to be threatened by. Well, you know, this just is a testament to the good work you're doing. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you didn't have that kind of influence, they would just ignore you completely. It actually just gives me the willies. That type of evil gives me the just... just where does that come from? It's like another universe. It is another. Well, and, it, and it's that level of fear on, on those corporate structure parts that just indicate that there's a huge cultural shift coming that uh, I've seen over the last year. You know, since we talked in this documentary that I've been showing, uh, what I've found is that there is something larger going on that is phenomenal. That will, as you said, you know, left, right's an illusion all that. We, we're somehow having this ability to see past these illusions, to see past these power structures that will just, I think, tear down the walls. Well, it's like it's like selling icy, frosty lemonades in hell. <laughs> I mean, 10, 11 years ago when I first got started, people were perceptive and receptive, but nothing, I mean, it's light years now. Yeah. I mean, there's almost a danger to that, though, because the people are so ready to, I, you know, I'm wondering two weeks after the London bombing is a government operation, and then mainstream newspapers are saying it. So, and, 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 but, but I'm also, though, seeing the discernment go up. People are also getting very discriminating, very selective. Uh, they're, they're seeing through disinfo operations very quickly, which is uh, very encouraging. It is encouraging, and I think, uh, you know, it's sort of the hundred monkey theory. You know that one? There's a larger collective unconsciousness that we're all keen into. And once that happens, then, you know, they can make all the threats they want. They can do all the sort of power grabs and pass all this legislation that turns it into a police state. I still believe that the larger consciousness, the publicist, will, uh, will break through. Oh, I agree. Let's talk more about that because mm -hmm. what did Gandhi say? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they attack you, then you win. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the movement will win. I'm just wondering if I can survive the attack. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Dean Hagelin, who again was uh, the star of the X-Files, one of the main stars on the show for nine seasons, ten years, and of course the lone gunman uh, 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 pilot, and then one season, which I thought was better than the X Files, personally. Thank you very much. Yeah, the writers did too, and, and they wanted to, uh, you know, bring up a lot more of the um, the less the ghost stories and the uh, the poo monsters that they had in the X Files, and go more into the conspiracy, but with the comedic edge, you know, as a way of getting some of these serious things across, but in a lighthearted tone. You know, Coast to Coast AM, uh, second biggest radio show in the country, it shifted a lot out of the ghost stories and stuff uh, into more of the New World Order stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the writers were trying to take that show in that direction uh, in an entertaining fashion, a way of bringing these ideas into the public forum. Is that because that's what the fans and the public wanted, or is that because that's what you guys wanted? I think uh, it was a combination. You know, the, the popularity of the gun and had a large uh, conspiracy contingent to it, and so they were going after that fan base and less from the, uh, uh, the shippers and the, you know, who loved... Uh, Mulder and Who Loves Scully kind of thing. Uh, your pilot episode, uh, tell us about that plot. Yeah, absolutely. This was a, a pilot episode um, for The Lone Gunman where the basic plot was the gunman had to stop a plane from flying into the World Trade Center uh, eight months before it actually happened. So uh, when we got the script, it said, you know, plane, World Trade Center, they filmed a, uh, an entire airplane. They had a, a green matte screen, so they put the... Uh, 
put the shot of the New York skyline in with the plane flying directly at it, and uh, just seconds before we get computer control, we get it back to the pilots, and the pilots can pull the plane up and, and avoid hitting the World Trade Center. And part of that plot was that, uh, as it said in the script, that this was to start an international war on terror, that this was, you know, the Cold War's over, and then for the arms race to continue and keep the economy going, that they would start an international war on terror by flying the plane into the World Trade Center. In fact, I want to play that clip from the lone gunman uh, uh, right now. Go ahead and roll that clip where they're describing uh, why this terrorist event is going to take place. Uh, you have uh, kind of the boss of the conspiracy theorists talking to his father who's in the government. Right. And, and so they're talking. Go ahead and roll that. We know it's a war game scenario, that it has to do with airline counterterrorism. Why is that important enough to kill for? Because it's no longer a game. But if some terrorist group wants to act out this scenario, why target you for assassination? Depends on who your terrorists are. The men who conceived of it in the first place. You're saying our government plans to commit a terrorist act against a domestic airline? There you go. Indicting the entire government as usual. It's a faction. A small faction. For what possible gain? The Cold War's over, John, but with no clear enemy to stockpile against, the arms market's flat. But bring down a fully loaded 727 into the middle of New York City, and you'll find a dozen tin pot dictators all over the world just clamoring to take responsibility and begging to be smart bombed. I can't believe it. This is about increasing arms sales. Mm -hmm. When? Tonight. How are you going to stop them? I think it is what it and then now we cut to the plane. Right. right. Modem protocol. Remote access. Somebody on the ground <laughs> yeah. the plane. You break in and save the your people. Course. That's right. We need to know our flight plan. I'm mapping the data now. in Washington, lower Manhattan. World Trade Center. We're going to crash the plane into the World Trade Center. I'll tell the story. All right. Now, we shot that in uh, uh, March of 2000. Uh, so that script was written probably around January, January, February 2000. And then that aired, that would have been September, I think, or maybe even January 2001, because it was a mid-season replacement. And then... September 2001 had happened. And I didn't even put it together. It was the writers who actually called me in the afternoon going, are you watching this? And I went, well, why are the writers from the X-Files calling me? You've been fixing your sink, right? Yeah, exactly. You remember that. Yeah, my, I got a, uh, my sink went. I was at Home Depot. I had, like, other issues than watching the TV all day. And then, uh, and then suddenly it all gelled together all at once. And That's kind of good that you were so unplugged from mainstream media that you didn't even know it was happening. <laughs> and well, I, knew, I heard about it. I knew it like right when it happened. Well, sure, enough, so they called you. But I mean, you yeah. hadn't gotten all the details, I understand. Yeah, yeah, it was really amazing. And it was a great day to go to Home Depot that day, by the way, I should point that out. Nobody was there. Nobody was there, and everybody was really helpful. So, so, so Chris Carter uh, called you up. Yeah, it was actually uh, Vince, Vince Gilligan, who, uh, who called me up and said he was watching that. Because Vince was... Uh, uh, he was the the real um, spearhead for getting the gunman to the air. Chris Carter and everybody were involved in writing it, but they were also involved with trying to save you know season eight of the X Files and and bring that show to a close somehow. So the focus was split. The writers were writing Lone Gunman episodes and writing X Files episodes at the same time. I actually saw news articles where Ashcroft went to Hollywood after nine eleven and said no more bad uh, 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 stories on us. We want you to work with us. And then I remember hearing that. Uh, in a news article that Fox didn't like the government because it was anti-government. And then I remember saying that you guys had gotten good ratings and it was a very popular series. Why cancel a winner? Yeah, well, you know, there's a, a series of reasons, including I wrote a comic book called Why the Lone Government Was Canceled, because it's such an involved story that involves not just, uh, you know, bad ratings, I'll get off the air. The ratings were good. Uh, the show was uh, fairly, you know, inexpensive. We were shooting up in Vancouver, so it wasn't about cost. 
Uh, Chris Carter and Fox at this point started having a, a bad relationship, so that may have played into it. But uh, but yeah, there there may have been uh, a larger. Well, just a microcosm of that. I mean, I've been on local radio, number one show at night against everything, making the station tons of money, and they just said, "Stop talking about the government. You're gonna or you're fired." And I I didn't shut up, and they fired me. So the, they had people lean on them. That's just at a local level. Now it's come out about. Hundreds and hundreds, and I'm telling you, it's thousands of reporters on government payrolls, not just in Iraq with fake news, but fake news fake, here. Fake, fake news here. And not only that, Chris Carter uh, tells a story, and I, I met the psychic who uh, was hired by the CIA just to hang out at Hollywood parties and then go back and drop emails about what she talked about. And this was the CIA keeping tabs on producers and writers of Hollywood movies because that's the... Because the psychic with them is like their psychologist. These people spill their guts. They spill their guts and she...